Hello and welcome guys to this section, a section where we will be examining uh, weaknesses in general and well, uh, primarily how to exploit those weaknesses. For those of you who have been following the Positional Chess series from start to finish, we are a little bit more than halfway through, I would say about two thirds of the way through in terms of overall material covered by now. And um, well, we have uh, weaknesses left to cover and also open and semi-open files and then a full game section and we will be done with the Positional Chess series. For those of you who are examining this just as a standalone topic, you're all very welcome and I hope that you enjoy this, uh, this coverage. The topics that we're going to be touching upon are topics such as uh, pawn advances to improve one's structure or conversely to damage one's the opponent's structure. We're going to just be talking about creating or provoking weaknesses. There's a variety of ways in which you might do that, and we'll examine some games. Uh, removing a key defender, especially, for example, when you have dark squared weaknesses, you might wish to remove the dark squared bishop. That is one of the most common examples. And we will see a game where Karpov with the white pieces does just that. We're also going to actually see a couple of Capablanca games where the dark squares in particular are exploited on the queen side. We will then see a couple of Karpov games where actually it's primarily weaknesses on the king side that are exploited. And uh, we will even see a Karpov game where his opponent uh, Spassky's weaknesses across the board are exploited. And finally, we will end with a rather curious uh, modern game between Sanan Sugirov and Peter Spidler, where there was a resignation very, very early on, on account of the tremendous collection of weaknesses that existed in the black position in Spidler's position. So there will be, I should note, a little bit of overlap for those of you who have followed the positional play series from the very beginning. But, you know, this is inevitable since all different topics and themes in chess are interrelated. And especially when you're speaking of positional play, as I mentioned at an earlier point, a lot of it has to do with the structure and, of course, the interplay of the pieces and the structure. And so inevitably, if you're talking about weaknesses here, and in the previous section we were discussing minor piece play, or in the section before that we might have been talking about space, you know, there is that overlap. So... For those of you who detect a little bit of overlap, please treat it as revision. I hope you get some value out of that. And for those of you who are taking this section as a standalone, well, I hope that you guys encounter some novel ideas and concepts and that you can benefit from that in your own games. So without further ado, let's begin with this first position taken from Capablanca versus Yates. Capablanca's last move after black played knight to c6 was the move bishop to d3. And here Yates plays a move that is not very advisable. He plays the move f5. And this is the first thing that I want to draw your attention to. We notice that all of these pawns are on light squares. And in fact, not only on the king side and center, but also on the queen side, Yates has arranged all his pawns on the light squares. This in and of itself is not necessarily a disaster, but the problem is that Yates's only remaining bishop is the light squared bishop. He would rather it be the dark squared bishop maybe positioned on one of these squares like d6 or e7. Now, that is because a bishop on those squares would complement the structure because not only would a bishop, let's say on e7, have way more uh, scope than a bishop stuck here behind the pawns on c8, but additionally, when one places all one's pawns on light squares, then you leave dark squared weaknesses behind, and that would be very, very useful instead of a light squared bishop to have a dark squared bishop somewhere to patch up those holes. So black's move f5 is dubious from the perspective that when the pawn is on f7, while it may be on a light square, it can aim to go to f6. And if it does go to f6, then it can start to patch up or influence those dark squares, control those dark squares. Even f6 itself will be better controlled like this. But once the pawn goes to f5, we can see that from there, the 
E5 square in particular and the G5 square additionally become quite severely compromised. So let's actually see what happened down the line in the game and whether or not Capablanca was able to exploit this particular consequence. Capablanca played queen d2, knight e5 followed. Now, knight e5 in and of itself is also maybe not so advisable because one thing that I, I like to stress to my students is that if you don't have, say, dark squared bishop and you're trying to patch up these dark squared weaknesses, you should look towards your knights and ask yourself what color square they're on. Because this knight on c6, being on a light square, is in fact influencing the dark squares. The opposite holds true for this knight on g7, which influences only the light squares. So by playing the move knight e5 and shifting that knight onto a dark square, it suddenly is only controlling light squares itself. And so black becomes increasingly unbalanced on those dark squares. We see that the knight from c6 was having a very, very important influence on d4 and e5. And after bishop to e2, knight c4, bishop takes, d takes, immediately Capablanca exploits this with the move queen to d4. By playing queen d4, notice that would not have been possible a few moves ago. Well, the black queen is challenged, and if black were to actually exchange the black queens, he won't have time to collect this free knight, because of course white will capture with the knight. And in this case, all of black's pawns remain stuck on the light squares, and he remains with this somewhat problematic bishop and a lot of weaknesses, especially the b6 square, c5, d6, e5 squares are all coming to mind. Instead, after queen d4, black played the move queen to c7. White insisted on exchanging the queens, and the problem is that black could not avoid it because the pawn on c4 will fall. And after queen takes c5 and knight takes c5, black is still unable to develop unless he plays a move such as b6, evicting the knight. The knight returned to a4, rook to b8, and now simply castle. And notice already a very, very concrete consequence. That d6 square, that weak dark square on d6. Notice how white is not seeking to invade on d7. That's under black control. White is also not seeking to invade on d5, under black control. Where white is targeting black, if we notice, is this loose pawn here on b6 and this entry point here on d6. So we're noticing that pattern of the dark squares being exploited. Black plays the move b5 to relieve the pressure on b6, but unfortunately that is met by knight c5. And again, a new uh, hole appears in the black position. Rook b6, uh, somewhat awkward rook lift necessary just to control the entry point on d6 and also support a6 and e6 and white goes a4 and challenges breaking down that structure on the queen side black plays knight h5 and b3 continuing the process c takes b3 c takes b3 b takes a4 and knight 3 takes a4 now this entire complex supports itself and after rook to c6, the pin is easily broken with the move king to b2. Black now drops the knight back, rook d2, a5, and, well, we could already stop more or less here after the move rook hd1, and notice that the white position has coordinated very nicely, and black continues to have some not only development issues, but also some issues with certain weak points, as well as this open file under white control which is going to lead to moves such as rook d6 in the future if black is not careful. However, I do want to show you a few more moves because in the very beginning, we started in this position here and I mentioned that the move f5 was problematic because especially it left this permanent outpost on e5. But however, as we've actually advanced in the position about 15 moves, we notice that here, white still hasn't made use of this e5 square nevertheless it remains a weakness so i would like to show you how that unfolds a few moves from now white plays here to move knight to d3 he seizes the opportunity with that rook on c6 and the other rook on f7 knight d3 
there is not only a beautiful outpost, but a concrete threat of a fork. Black one goes rook b7 to avoid the fork, knight e5 anyway, rook c to c7, and rook to d4. And this is really uh, quite a pretty picture because white's position is so solid on those dark squares and his structure is so compact, we can say that really he only has one weakness and that is the b3 pawn. But the weakness is only being attacked once and it is being defended once. So for now, white is perfectly okay in coping with this one weakness. We cannot have completely perfect position all the time. So this is a very minor issue compared with black's issues along the dark squares and also concretely a5, e6 and this bishop on c8. I'm just going to show one more, I think, quite instructive point of this game, which is that after the move king to g7, Capablanca recognized that probably the greatest asset for black is this knight here on d5, which is keeping the two rooks at bay. And also it's very, very central and it's eyeing up some interesting squares such as b4 in the future, or even a rerouting to the king side, because if we notice, for instance, black may seek to target this f2 pawn, the base of the king side structure. However, Capablanca exploits this and plays the move pawn to e4, the idea being that now the knight must either move or black, as in the game, was compelled to capture on e4. The problem with capturing on e4 is that after rook takes e4, white has exchanged his e pawn for black's f pawn. The consequence is that black now has an additional pawn island, which is an isolated pawn to boot. So suddenly we have a weakness on a5, a weakness on e6, and general weaknesses across the dark squares, which leaves as a consequence this light squared bishop is a very, very, very bad piece. If we fast forward a couple of moves right here, on move 39, black plays bishop d7, and a comment I really want to make to just point this out is that this is the first time that the black light squared bishop has moved in the entire game. And this is a very important point, is a natural consequence of leaving oneself with too many weaknesses on the other color. In this particular case, the dark squares. So we have a light squared bishop, and because the dark squares are so weak, black struggled, for example, to ever advance this pawn. And because he couldn't advance the pawn, black consequently struggled to develop the light squared bishop along its most common or typical diagonal. Finally, well, when one reaches a state such as this position, uh, generally speaking, it's considered that there's too many weaknesses and almost certainly the position cannot be defended because a skilled player is going to target, chip away at all of the weaknesses, all of the sources of instability, and it's not going to be possible to hold everything. Something's got to give. So that's the last thing I want to show you in this game. White played the move knight to c3, and notice that knight takes knight is not possible because of Rook takes bishop with check, intermezzo, and then collect the knight. So therefore black played rook c5. This is necessary because any other rook move would be met by knight takes d5, e takes d5, and rook takes d5, winning a pawn. And so after rook c5, white was able to navigate the knight to e4 with tempo on the rook. The rook dropped back to b5, knight e to d6. The rook went back to c5. And the point of the maneuver is seen after White's next move, knight to b7, hitting that rook that has been shuffling back and forth between b5 and c5, but also hitting the a5 pawn. So after uh, rook c7, it was not going to improve matters for black if he played rook b5, since the pawn on a5 is falling regardless. So after knight b7, rook c7, knight b takes a5, and eventually a pawn has fallen and Capablanca did indeed convert this position about 30 moves later. So I hope you enjoyed this particular game and it really was a good illustration of the exploitation of dark squares specifically on the queen side and the consequences that that can have on the light squared bishop. What was Frederick Yates's main problem? Well, I would say that his main problem was 
moves such as f5 and then following it on with this maneuver knight e5 to c4 very very careless with the dark squares instead the pawn should have been kept here or if advanced maybe advanced only one square onto f6 and control those dark squares and this knight on c6 should have been kept here if you're going to move a knight perhaps move this knight over to some square like f5 or somewhere else where it might control dark squares and also try to address your development issues so that concludes our uh, first game and the second game is also a Capablanca game so let's show that now let's see there